Well, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be turning to the Gospel of John. If you're a visitor here, we've been working our way through John over the last few years. And we find ourselves in John chapter 19, and we continue our journey through the passion story, or through the story of the death of Jesus. John chapter 19. Now, we're going to be considering this evening just verse 28 to 30. But I'd like us to read from verse 28 through to 37. <clears throat> this is God's word for you this evening. After this, Jesus knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs." But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. So far, the reading of God's word, may he bless it to our hearts and souls and minds. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for your word. And we pray, as we've just sung, that you would show us Christ. Lord, there are people here who may have never looked to Christ before. Show them Christ. There are people here who have looked to Christ a very long time ago and who tire of him. Show us Christ. There are people here who love to gaze upon Jesus Christ. Show us Christ. That through the preaching of your word, we might behold his glory. The glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. You came to bring life, eternal life, Jesus. Would you feed us with it once more? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, You'll have to forgive me, I'm not used to preaching with microphones directly in front of me, so if I wander away, Ellen will throw something at me. But we'll do our best to remain st standing still. <laughs> well, when I was about 10, 10 or 11, I remember a teacher once gave me 100 lines. This was about the year after they removed the cane, so it was probably a good thing. Um, and I can remember going into the classroom during lunchtime, and he happened to also be the principal, and he was a very stern principal, and he said to me, you've, you, you've, here's your lunch break, you sit here and you write lines until you get to 100 or you run out of time. And I remember being very frustrated, but I mean, it was my own fault. I think I ignored the teacher and then argued with the teacher about why I was right and ignoring the teacher to begin with. You know how this goes. Well, maybe you don't, but I know how this goes. And so I sat down and I started writing the lines, and and by, by the time the bell went for the end of lunch, I had got to like number 90. And I can remember the principal, I can just vividly remember this. The principal walks in and he says to me, okay, Logan, time's up. 
time to go to class. And I said to him, sir, can I finish? Can I, I mean, I've never got to 100 before, you know, this is a great achievement. I've never made it to, it's probably not a great achievement, kids, don't listen to me. This is a great achievement, I've, I've almost made it to 100. And he said, no, I will not let you. This, I, I'm not sure if this was a follow-up punishment or something, but he's like, no, you can't. Lunch is over, you leave. And I argued with him, really bad idea. So I got more lines the next day. But I, I just, I remember just the sense of like frustration and disappointment because it wasn't finished. And I just wanted to finish it. Could you imagine what it must have been like for Jesus leading up to the cross? He came to do a task, didn't he? He came to achieve something. He came to fulfill a mission for his father in heaven. His father said to him, son, we're going to save the people. And you need to go and die for that to be achieved. You're going to take their sin and you're going to carry it to the cross and you're going to be crucified so that they don't need to be punished. And we're going to give them your perfection so that when they approach the throne of God, they get welcomed like I welcome you. So go and fulfill the mission. And, and Jesus leaves heaven and is born in this world. And, and there comes a point in his ministry where it says that he sets his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. So I'm on a mission. I have one task. And so he says to his disciples, and John, as he's drawing near the end, he keeps saying, I, I, have, a, I have a road before me. I have a path before me. I've got a job to do. My glory is approaching. I have a mission to finish. And can you imagine through, through all of the build-up as he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, just sweating over the anguish of what he's going to have to deal with. And, and as, he, as he walks and is arrested and as he's tried and as he's beaten, and as he keeps looking forward to the reality of what's going on, and he's waiting waiting for it to be done, that sense of longing for completion must have been palpable, must have been overwhelming. And yet now he cries out. Now, it doesn't say it in John. In John, it just says he, he said. If you, if you take this and you plant it together with the other Gospels, because remember we've got the four stories, if you sit it with the others, what you'll notice is in the other Gospels, it talks about a, a loud cry being uttered. You remember that? He utters a, a loud cry and then dies. Well, I think it, you can probably put those together. He utters a loud cry. He asks for a drink so he can moisten his throat in order to be able to project his voice and cry out, It is finished. He cries it so that everyone can hear. And we have to ask ourselves, what is finished? What's he talking about? Have you ever stopped and asked yourself that? Have you, have you just, or have you just assumed you know, if you've been a Christian a long time, maybe you've just assumed you know what he means when he says, it is finished. And in the Greek, it's just one word. He just cries out, finished. And then he bows his head and gives his spirit back to God. What does he mean? Well, firstly, there's a sense in which it's, it's, it's finished for the crowd, isn't it? There's, there's, a big, there's a big crowd there, isn't there? There's a bunch of people watching. We've got the four soldiers at the foot. We've got the four ladies which we know from the other Gospels are part of a larger group of ladies that are watching. There's, at a minimum, John watching. There's, we're told, people who are passing by from the city. There's probably quite a crowd of people who are watching. And Jesus cries up, it is finished. And, and what's that mean for them? Well, for the soldiers, it means, well, my day's almost done. The job's almost complete. I can go back and see my wife and kids. 
For the Jews, it's relief and victory at last, isn't it? You, you could imagine those who ridiculed Jesus, the religious leaders standing there watching, just, just reveling in what they see, reveling in, in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, just filled with joy and delight that they'd finally done it. They'd finally gotten rid of this pain in the neck who was constantly pestering them. They finally won. And for the demons, it must have been a great victory. If you could see them, you could imagine the demons and the devil himself rejoicing over the death of the Son of God. We've done it. This is the one that's meant to save Israel. We've done it. Like in the parable, we've killed the heir. And so the property is going to be ours. We've defeated the king of the earth. And so we are now the victors. But for the woman, and for John, and for the other disciples when they hear, it would have been despair, wouldn't it? It is finished. And Jesus dies. And you could imagine, you could imagine them standing there and their hearts sinking. Maybe up till this point they had just been longing that Jesus would just hop down off the cross. You know, the, remember the mockers? You know, prove you're, the, prove you're God. Prove you're the Son of God. Just hop down from the cross and we'll believe in you. And you can imagine them sitting there like, would you do it? We know you could do it. Just do it. It would be amazing. Just show yourself. Why are you not doing anything? Why are you not fighting back? And so when they hear, it is finished, they would be filled with despair. It's an unbelievably sad day when injustice wins, isn't it? And then at the same time, it's a day of rejoicing for other people. Think about the euthanasia law. How many of you, when you read the news of the euthanasia bill going through, were just grieved in your heart? That our country has come so low that we're going to help people kill themselves. And yet... There's a whole plethora of people, 60%, who are rejoicing. It is finished, had a very different sound to the crowd. It was a very dark word on a very dark day. And yet, Christ wasn't primarily speaking to them, was he? Primarily, he was speaking to his father. Primarily, he was speaking like a prayer to his Father in heaven. I said earlier that Christ, Christ came on a mission. And so Christ on the cross had been called to frailty. You think about it. He came and he took human flesh on, the God of all creation, he whom in six days made the entirety of the universe, which is so infinitely big that we will never see the end of it. The one who flung the stars into space takes on the same limitations of physicality that you took on, that you have. And, and he walks through the mire and the bog of human frailty and he twists his ankle and he hurts himself, and he's picked on, and he's made fun of. And he endures the death of his father, his earthly father. But, but so much more than that, he goes to the cross, and he, and he bears upon himself the wrath of God. He bears upon himself the, the sin of humanity. He bears upon himself the full weight of the curse of God, so that we can say, he who knew no sin, he who had never sinned, became sin, was made sin. Do you imagine what it must have been like for the righteous, perfect, holy, holy, holy God to wear sin? This is he of whom, when sin came in contact with him in the wilderness, 
fire came out and consumed people. You know, we, we, struggle to de- we struggle to understand because we live in sin. This is our life. I think the easiest analogy is one I heard Sinclair Ferguson make, another preacher, and he says, he says it's a little bit like a very rich person who lives at the top of a very, very large apartment. He's got the penthouse suite on the top, and he's never smoked a day in his life. And the air is beautiful and clear. He sits outside on his penthouse balcony and, and looks over the city, and, and one day he needs to come down. And he comes down the 58 floors and walks out of the elevator, and he walks into a host of people who are all smokers, and they're all smoking. You know, the smokers don't smell it, do they? But he smells it. He struggles to breathe in it. And so Jesus comes in like hopping out of that elevator into a wealth of sin. And he carries all of it to the cross. And then he cries out, it is finished. What's finished? The wrath of God is done. The curse is done. The sin is done. The punishment is finished. He he said My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's finished. I am not forsaken any longer. And it's like a a plea from a son, a faithful son to his father saying, I've done what you've sent me to do. I finished it. It's a plea from a servant to a master seeking to show that he has been faithful in all he has done. And you could imagine the response of the father, well done, good and faithful servant. You could imagine the father in in some way that is beyond the sphere of our mental capacities. You could imagine the father looking down upon his son and smiling with approval and saying, behold, my son, in whom I am well pleased. For you have done what I sent you to do. Or as, as the Reverend S. W. Gandhi puts it, he hell in hell laid low, made sin, he sin overthrow. Bowed to the grave, destroyed it so, and death by dying slew. He took the reality of everything and finished it. He finished it. And so for the joy set before him, it says in Hebrews, he he bears the weight of the reality of the punishment of God. Hebrews 12 tells us, and for the joy set before him, he endures the cross and despises the shame and marches through it and out the other end. And he says, it's finished. I never need to go to the cross again. You know, the Catholics, they want to keep crucifying Jesus over and over and over again in their theology. And the writer to the Hebrew says, we have a one-time sacrifice. He was sacrificed once and for all so that all could be made clean so that you could be made clean and so that I could be made clean and so that you could be called sons and daughters of God. And yet this this cry which echoed into the crowd and this, this cry which spiritually echoed to the ears of the Father has echoed for 2,000 years, hasn't it? Augustine preached on this twice. It is finished. Spurgeon preached on this four times. It is finished. Luther preached on this. It is finished. Year after year after year, the church of Jesus Christ has stood up and held forth John 19, and Christ proclaims again tonight, it is finished for the church. He finished it for the church. He finished it for you. He finished it for me. He finished it for sinners so that sinners could come to him and find eternal life. 
He finished the law, didn't he? The, the law. You have to keep the law perfectly, Jesus says. You want, to, you want to get into the kingdom of God? Be better than the Pharisees. Be better than the guys that are the most perfect in law keeping. It's finished. He's kept the law. He's finished your sin. He's dealt with it. He took it all. And he took it to the cross. He took the curse of God that was upon you. Because cursed is anyone that is hung on a tree, it says in the word of God. He took your death. He died so that you don't die forever. He took your hell so that hell is finished for you. 1 John 3.8 says, The Son of God appeared for this purpose. This is why Jesus came, to destroy the works of the devil. Since the time of Adam and Eve, the devil has worked to destroy the salvation of people. And Christ came and destroyed all of his works. It is finished. The works of the devil are finished. For our sake, 2 Corinthians, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Why? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Sin is finished. Righteousness has come. And the question, the question for you tonight, the most important question you can ever answer in your life is, is it finished for me? See, it's not enough for Christ to have finished it for others. Has he finished it for you? Has he finished it for you? Has he finished it for you? Is your sin done away with? Has your curse been removed? Has the law been fulfilled? Has righteousness been provided? When he says, When he says in about 35 AD, it is finished, does that echo all the way into 2020 and you sit here and it speaks with power into your ears and you say, yes, it is. It is finished. No more. In sin do I stand. But bold I approach. Bold I approach. Because of the eternal Son of glory who has finished everything for me. You know, it, it's a fascinating thing. It is finished. For those who were there, it was nothing but a death. It was nothing but a death. Do you realize it was loss? It was loss. It was a losing cry. And yet, don't we sing? Don't we sing? Finished was the victory cry. Don't we sing that? It it was no losing cry. Christ wasn't defeated. He was victorious. This was his victory shout. Was it a victory shout for you? Because if it's not, if it's not, you stand in the exact same place as as the soldiers and as the Jewish, Jewish leaders and all the people that passed by that day watching who said, hey, there's another dead guy on a cross. Do you look at the cross and see your sin? It was My sin, we sung earlier, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, we thank you for this 
for the single word that you uttered upon the cross. Finished. Accomplished. Completed. We thank you that in your death we live. And Lord, I just pray, I pray for these people right now that that none of them would leave here tonight without being say, uh, being able to say, it's finished for me. You were finished. Lord, press that upon our hearts. Give us hearts to believe. In Jesus' name we pray.